flood debris. One way or the other, what we would expect on a slope generally, if the slope was relatively active, would be um, harder uh, consolidated sediment of the type that you see sparsely interspersed between the generally predominantly fine-grained sediment. When you see this fine-grained sediment as kind of a mantle over the entire area, it gives you a very first-order approximation of how active the area is geologically. The sediment piles up everywhere in the deep ocean in lieu of other activities. So if there aren't any currents uh, to flush it away or energetic uh, events, including submarine landslides yeah, or debris to flows to kind of mantle it with coarser sediments yeah. or grains or class from upslope, then what you'll have in lieu of that will be just a Great. blanket we'll over everything. For ID kind of like what we're seeing right now. Of the move, Sean. Sorry, one more time. What's the progress of the last move? Oh. All stopped. Copy that. Again, we're looking at a pink mushroom coral uh, on a small pebble. These are very small individuals that we're looking at and uh, they appear to be a, there's like some sort of an associate in between the polyps i'm not sure what that is but that's a really interesting thing to see maybe a type of ribbon worm or some other type of worm i'll try to hold that for 10 seconds or so One other thing that I can highlight here based on this shot is we can see from the sediment that's not the just hemipelagic oh, fine grain sediment, go. a pretty broad variety Take of shapes, sizes, Keep and colors up. of rocks on the seafloor right here. And this kind of uh, underpins what uh, Calvin Campbell from the Geological Survey of Canada was saying, that this is likely glacially derived material. Um, a hallmark of glacially derived sediment is just how varied it is, because glaciers are, without a doubt, the bulldozers of the geological world. They push everything in front of them, they mix it up, and just crush it up underneath the glacier. And in outburst floods that occur, rivers that are either flowing underneath, in front of, or sometimes when a glacial lake dam bursts uh, catastrophically, moving out ahead, Everything just gets mixed up, transported uh, many hundreds or even thousands of kilometers yeah, down with the glacier or in front of it, which is what glacial moraines are. Um, and what you end up seeing is just a generally poorly sorted mess of sediment. And so if you hand a geologist anywhere a hand sample or a grab sample from an area, and it's just incredibly poorly sorted material of all varieties, every, everything from fine grain clay or rock flour down to uh, boulders that could potentially be the size of cars that are called glacial erratics, they'll probably tell you that it might be glacially sourced sediment. It's just one, one kind of clue that it can be used. Now we're seeing some sort of ruffled sponge. Uh, let's take a zoom on this pilot if we can. That's great. Which direction shot? This looks a little like one of the pictures in our high priority sponge guide. Let's see if we can There are a few species that were pointed out as possibly being of interest for collection that are unknown or undescribed from this area. This one looks a little like the picture of partial? what is a potential uh, Fakelia. Oh. Anyone <laughs> unsure have any thoughts about this sponge? Okay, video unstable. Let's go uh, zoom in a little more here. For them to ID it. How are we doing on the move, Dan? Hi, Megan. Um, it, it could be a Fakelia. It does resemble very much the the image from the gully that we had sent. Um, it would be great to get a piece of it, if possible, to confirm. Well, can we get a sample of that? Yeah. Thank you. We yeah. could grab the whole rock and then leave part of it on the ground. Or I will never say no to rocks. I mean, the rock might be stuck, but it, it, the rocks do look very Can loose here. Can we zoom uh, that yeah. associate that was sitting on the top of the sponge before yeah. we take a sample? Snap in. The, oh. That little shrimp, these little shrimps. What are those? They're doing this really odd behavior, these 
little uh, crustaceans. I'm trying to figure out if they're isopods. They kind of look like um, really interesting isopods to me. It gets like a, it looks like a port outer to me. Sure. And I say that because I'm looking at the uh, the tail end of the organism, and right it doesn't look like it has a fan tail. Inward. It looks like it's sort of cane. And but what makes it really weird is this sort of elongated uh, carapace, where all the arm walking legs are. There's like three pairs of walking legs in the back, and then you have like the uh, clasping arms really, really far in the front. I really hope we can grab some of these too. I think they're really interesting. Uh, Tim, do you know possibly what um, these uh, nice. isopods are? Try to hold that. Copy. Yeah, and that's a that's a call out to uh, Tim Shank at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He's one of our scientists on shore. Um, I don't think he's on the line right now. He is active in the chat room and says uh, that he's pretty sure that they are isopods. Copy. I'm going to index in or turn hydraulics on. Okay. Pilot, how large is this whole rock? Uh, let me get lasers on it. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we're going to go for a collection of this entire uh, rock sample. It's about uh, 20 centimeters wide um, to get the sponge and uh, numerous associates that are on the sponge as well. Yeah, Hold that. grabbing the whole thing, it's more likely that the animals that are on the sponge will stay there. Uh, but if we disturbed the actual sponge material, it, it might make them try to swim away. So we'll see what happens. Hi there. Uh, when you guys were zoomed in, I could tell on the sponge that there were these small nodules throughout the tissue. Oh, Those could be gametes, so eggs or sperm sacs. Right. So it could be reproductive. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you're able to also preserve a piece in formalin, that. but if so, that would be great. Yeah, we can definitely preserve some in formalin as a subsample. Um, I was actually thinking it could be associated in enemies. We've seen that a number of times in different sponges. Yeah, so it also appears that the class that we're after is two separate pieces. And when we went to grab it with an manipulator arm, a uh, perturbed crustacean, what looked like, uh, was yep, squashed out from underneath and is now uh, telling us yep. to get off his lawn. So that crustacean is a type of squat lobster. I'll tilt the zoom down. Fantastic, and it looks like we got the whole class with uh, sponges on it, as well as associates. Hopefully they'll stick around for the whole sampling process so we can get the bio boxes closed. Okay. I'm going to drop it in. There's ready to close. Yeah. So watch, it looks like part of it fell off the rock, but I think it's all in there. Nicely done, Pat. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so we got, uh, I think, full collection of that and all the associates. Uh, we're going to tuck our uh, sampling tray and back underneath the ROV and uh, get back underway. Okay, I think the ship was stopped, right? Yep. Feels like shoulder as its left hits the stop sooner than it used to. Maybe that's just me. It's 
possible. We did adjust those over the winter. Oh, we did? Or Todd did, yeah. When we got it back from... Oh, Craig. you had to reteach the uh, yeah. limits? Yep. Okay, on that weekend, I was gone. Yep. Okay. All right, so why don't you uh, get out ahead a little bit before we call the next move in. Sounds great. Yeah, it certainly looks like these uh, mushroom corals are in zero fairly zero. decently high abundance, uh, encrusting the uh, debris field that we're seeing as we're moving up uh, the slope. I've got a good feeling about this dive. We're seeing more and more rocks. We're going to get to some more consolidated hard substrate soon. That's what my, uh, my rock sense is telling me. Watch, did you need a zoom of this or not? Just the same one. Uh, let's zoom Good it snap. since it's on something yeah. weird looking. It's like a Good snap it video. What? What is it on, Jeff? Is it like, it so looks like, I would have said it looked like coral, but it's <laughs> white. No, just uh, based on color alone, without any other information, I would uh, be inclined to say that something like a quartz-like uh, mineral, um, or it could also be based on the color, some sort of metamorphic uh, rock, something marble or similar. And a metamorphic rock is any type of rock, whether that's sedimentary or igneous or even another metamorphic uh, that, that is partially stay, modified by heat and pressure at depth but isn't entirely liquefied and reformed into igneous rocks like uh, basalt. Uh, so that's my guess. Uh, Calvin in the chat room also uh, speculates that it's quartz. Um, zoom in on the rock, yeah. So that's, I think, our, uh, our best guess. a teensy tiny urchin on the rock. Do you see it? Oh wow, that is a tiny one. It's, it's super small. Copy. Um, so I don't think I can go any further than urchin. But that's a <laughs> that's how great our cameras are here, is we can zoom in and see this animal that is probably only a centimeter large. All right, pilot's clear. We'll keep going. Should we start with uh, maybe 20 meters? Sounds good. Yeah, keep things going. 20 meters at sure. Uh, zero, 010. Zero. Sure. Copy. Holding the frame. Yeah, and it definitely does. Uh, this uh, tentatively identified as quartz uh, stone stands out in relief to a lot of the more generally uh, dark colored, uh, likely mafic rocks that we've been seeing in this area. And just to, to reiterate, that kind meters. of uh, yeah. gets the idea that glacially sourced sediments are the smorgasbord of the geology Looks world, where you're just ball, yeah. everything is getting what bulldozed underneath the glacier and pushed out ahead of it, uh, crushed up and uh, spit out uh, in either glacial outburst flood or end moraine or one of these other processes yeah. that happen over the course of the glacial interglacial cycle which has a dominant periodicity of 120,000 years. And to expand on that a little bit, that just means that there's typically about 120,000 years between um, glacial maximums, which would be when the glaciers are at their southernmost extent, the oceans are at their lowest level, all of that water in the ocean is sucked into the glaciers during uh, much colder temperatures and uh, sea level high stands or glacial minima when glaciers are at their northernmost extent and sea levels are highest. And that's particular to the northern hemisphere. It's opposite for the southern hemisphere, the northern and southernmost, by the way. As we're looking around, you can definitely tell that we're on a slope. We lift left, we lift right, 
and on your screen, everything is sloped, sloped upwards. We're definitely on the right track. Yeah, it's nice to get this uh, side pan at times to kind of give an idea of the relief that we're on. Sometimes it's a little uh, a little difficult to see relatively. Looking at feed number two from the Sirius cam can sometimes give a little more context and has been really uh, illuminating in a couple of our earlier dives when we were at the edge of a pretty awe-inspiring sheer cliff and uh, couldn't see it from the D2 view, the Deep Discover camera one feed, but was really apparent in uh, Sirius. Coming up into view now is a, a yellow coral that I might like to take a look at. Copy. So it could That's be another one of the yellow boot, zerds, that one that reminded you yeah. of a cactus. Uh, but a lot of corals can have this yellow color. So the best way to identify a coral is by looking at the structure of the polyps. Okay, video, can frame these guys up. try to get those polyps. And this coral also has a crinoid or feather star associate. And perhaps I s am spotting a shrimp in the branches. Or maybe it's a crab. I'm not sure. There's some sort of pink organism in there. But looking at these polyps, it kind of reminds me of a different type of coral. Not a plexorid, but um, uh, starts with an A. Yep. Uh, Lindsay at DFO identifies it in the chat room. Gorge, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh man, it starts with an A. I know this one. You got it. Yeah. So um, the acanthogorges are interesting because they can't fully retract their polyps uh, like the plexorids can do. So if we were Go to disturb top, this maybe. coral, or if it was to be disturbed, um, the, po the tentacles would close, but the polyps wouldn't be able to retract. Hmm. Another fun fact about this organism, if we were to collect it, um, it would turn black what? when we preserved it in ethanol. Thank you. All right, Levi. I'll turn to port just a little bit. Copy yeah. is complete. Yeah, and... Uh, Tim Shank on land, one of our shore-based scientists, does note uh, that the isopods that we were looking at on the sponge sample that we collected, that ruffled yeah, sponge, uh, he couldn't get a good positive ID on it. Um, and he has a huge reference of uh, deep sea biology that to compare that to. Um, and so has it yeah, framed grad. And that kind of reiterates the purpose of getting the actual sure. physical samples of these organisms back on land, because sometimes even with the stunning HD video of uh, D2 is that we just can't get the right angle or the right feature to look at it sometimes, especially if it's an internal feature that is diagnostic. And uh, that's the point of getting the entire organism back. Yeah, I guess that, that red organism that I thought might be a crab or a shrimp is a, actually a uh, type of brittle star. Copy, thanks. That has a really soft central disc. Yeah, hard to, hard to see with it nested in the forest there. Yeah, why don't you come back to starboard a bit? I'll just get three centered on zero one zero. And then there's this, uh, the white sort of coral-like structure up ahead that might be interesting. I'll grab that guy and then we'll... Sure. I'm also seeing a number of encrusting nema sponges on all of these rocks. So each rock seems to have this, this nema sponge. So it looks like a white coral, and 
We don't have a great view yet, but I Come do in. see a snake star on it, so I'm thinking it might be a Paragorgia. Because we often see a uh, Paragorgia and a snake star associated together. And as we've zoomed in, uh, it does look like it is a Paragorgia, which is a bubblegum coral. Yeah, our DFO colleagues uh, did inform us that this is a uh, known species in this uh, distribution range. And uh, that zoom in with uh, D2's amazing camera just highlights that it is an absolutely paragorgeous species. So the paragorgeous species that's known from this area is Paragorgia arborea. Um, and I was wondering if it also nice. has a, a white or light colored morph or if this is a normal color for that species or Captain. perhaps this is a different species. You know, actually on sonar it kind of looks like uphills around 355. Hi, um, there are several different color morphs. Yeah. Um, Pilot, can we get a quick zoom of the brittle star in the background? Yeah. Pink, and uh, we've looked at them genetically, the at least Science from the, the gully stone fence, and they're all the same species of Arborea. Yeah, we're just taking a quick zoom in the background of that brittle star at the request of uh, Tim Shank, who pointed out that it has, uh, uh, the central disc is interesting to him. Watch, Lee, did you need a closer look at the brittle star, or was that a Oh uh, no, I think that should be good. Thank you. Understood. Sounds good, video. Do you want me to pan down or uh, tilt down? Tilt you down here. Sorry. <laughs> I said it, wasn't you? Yeah. All right. We have left off. So we're going to put our next move in at due north, which is what I'm looking at now, so you don't have to come over too much. But Yeah, and as, uh, as pointed out, yeah. um, and then, we saw a number yeah. of those Paragorgia uh, uh, species in our previous Capital dives, Atlas. I believe, yeah, in the Goalie go. Canyon yeah. MPA. Is that correct, yeah. Megan? Pilot is go. Pilot is go. Yes, this species has been known from the Goli. So again, we're seeing a number of these uh, Pseudoanthemastis uh, mushroom corals on these uh, cobbles and uh, boulders in this area. Another, probably one of those uh, Acanthagorgia yellow corals. They tend to look very, very fluffy. And that's usually because of what I said earlier about them not being able to fully retract their polyps. So they have a overall fluffier appearance than uh, Plumsaurus. So corals. many of these brittle stars on the ground. Yeah, it's interesting to note as well, uh, looking at sure. our slope map that was prepared by our mapping lead, uh, Mike White, quick, for this dive, um, it looks like we're thereabouts on the slope yeah, maximum of our 12, yeah. uh, trek I mean, I up the just like wall of this inner canyon island. Um, the and the we're still not oh, seeing uh, yeah. the kind of sheer relief that we've seen in several of the ones the other day. So also what is conspicuously absent is the slope perpendicular yeah, looks like in the sorry slope parallel there. rills which were depressions in the seafloor kind of gullies within the gully canyon that we observed during the first dive and again those can be uh, focusing conduits for sediment flows downslope along the canyon walls we haven't seen any of those yet and that would be one uh, kind of 
obvious evidence of sediment transport activity Ooh. happening in relatively recent geological times. Shark that doesn't animals. mean that that's not necessarily happening here, but if it is, they might be more cascading uh, diffuse sediment flows where it's sediment mixing with a lot of the overlying water, so it wouldn't be dense enough to actually erode into the seabed and create the rills that we are observing on our first dive. <laughs> Yeah, we've seen a good number of these uh, sharks in our vicinity. And also glancing at the uh, feed two of Sirius, I've noticed that a couple of them have been hanging around in the vicinity. So maybe this is a similar thing with the short fin squid that we were observing on our dive yesterday that the uh, light show put on by our two body ROV system is uh, assisting oh, them in their uh, hunt for food. We'll let it go. We saw a pink fallen over coral. It was on this very small uh, cobble. And sometimes, if you are a coral and you settle on a substrate like a small cobble or boulder, and you get to be a big fan, the current can push you over. So, corals need to be, well, maybe a little more careful when choosing their substrate to grow on because they can't move to another substrate. Um, so, you know, if you're a coral, you grow too big and you fall over, that could be the end of your story. But not always. I have seen some uh, toppled corals start growing upwards in the same way that trees on land that get toppled in a storm uh, can start growing upwards and, uh, you know, just curve their trunks toward the water column. And that's an interesting 20. contrast to uh, something that we observed yesterday, Megan, uh, um, which Georgia was Germany. several sure. sea anemones that were tumbling by in the current, like driftweeds. Yeah. So exactly. those ones, I guess, don't that have that problem. If they topple over, they can just release and uh, wait for the current to take them to another more favorable place. But I guess for a coral, you kind of have to uh, take your house shopping a little more seriously. And one of the things that I'm uh, a little bit interested in is coral settling cues. I don't know much about it, but, you know, as we watch more and more of this video, we see patterns at, that corals seem to settle always on higher areas or more often on these higher areas and larger uh, consolidated formations on the seabed. And it would be really interesting to figure out how they find these areas. It's probably because of currents passing over those areas being better, so probability of their larva going over them uh, is higher. So, but what, what really causes those corals to settle out and start growing is something that fascinates me. And you might notice as well that the uh, track that the Discover is taking up the slope is kind of a zigzag pattern. And that's for the, I assume, I don't have confirmation on this, for the same reason that uh, you do switchbacks to climb up a steer mountain face because it's a less steep gradient when you're going up uh, diagonal to the slope instead of directly up the face. Also, looking back and forth does give us more surveyed area. So if we were to see or find something interesting, looking back and forth gives us more opportunity to find uh, snap something the of video. Uh, interest. Especially since, you know, we're working at pretty deep depth, which means that our movements are relatively slow. So that gives us more time to survey uh, in a small area instead of making really fast moves. 
Right now in our view, we are seeing another sea star. So this is again, another new uh, species for the dive. Well, I'll get you closer video, hold on. Zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Do you think Chris Ma is watching on a Sunday? So I this star um, has a really sort of robust shape, very, very inflated arms. All Very right. star -like. A little more stable video. You can come in. Really stands in stark contrast to the brittle stars uh, surrounding it. Yeah, right. And I, again, I'm looking through the animal guide uh, to see if there's a good match. This does look very similar to something I've seen before. Looks like it's actually uh, starting to flatten out more. We'll able to see further. 50 um, meters out. Yeah, there could just be a, I mean, like a little Maybe it was a slight step. offset. Yeah, or maybe we're already, that. or it could so be I'm a step. For my best match here. Or we're already starting to see the top. You said that was full type video? I don't think oh, okay. that's it. But, All right. but it looks sort of like it might be in the family Celesterity, uh, perhaps. The one I think it looks most like is. Uh, the genus Nepanthia. It also has relatively, you know, inflated arm structure. Megan, what is that uh, little snail-looking thing uh, to oh, the left of the, uh, the white color sea star? That's a snail. Okay. <laughs> and what you're seeing is um, this long tube siphon that it's using to sort of sense around itself, sticking out the end of uh, the snail shell. All right, pilot's clear and video's clear. Let's frame up, maybe I splash lasers on it. So if you're just joining us, this is Megan Putz from the University of Hawaii, your biology lead. And this is Jeff Obeltz from the Naval Research Lab, your geology lead. We are currently diving at a depth of 1,450 meters at the Northeast Channel dive site in Canada. And we also want to send out a warm welcome to our friends at the National the History Museum in Halifax and the Canadian uh, yeah, Museum so of Nature in Ottawa, who are swing, currently live streaming stable our dive so um, welcome everyone move. i hope you guys North are enjoying your labor day weekend it's a great day for right, museum touring on. yeah yeah no, it looks great the dive here North at the northeast moment. channel yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that chris mall can you remind me what yeah. the plan was it was to go all the way up i'm the sorry did i just back miss the to an interesting depth yeah, uh, no, yeah, so we just met, left it um, but i would love to hear top, more about it what kind of starfish was that and then depending on okay um, um so the nice okay, close up that you guys are in less, uh, uh, we get to let me see there the there peripheral plates and, items, and, and they're what's the called paxillate right um, so top. this is okay. probably uh, something uh, called radiaster um, <laughs> it's not something there are a couple of these in the pacific but uh, i don't know how often we saw it um, i think i know I, we've seen it at least once but it's been historically thought of as being, it's a, a Paxilocidin, so they inhabit uh, sort of a sedimented bottom. It's thought that they actually uh, buried themselves into the unconsolidated sediment, but as we've been discovering uh, over the last several years, uh, just because they kind of look like they bury themselves, it doesn't mean that they always do, or if they, if they do, uh, they don't do it like all the time. Um, I don't know if this has ever been imaged, like, you know, alive before. So um, that's, that's definitely uh, something I had to, to look a couple of times at um, uh, before getting, like, a good sort of reckoning of the diagnostic character. Um, I get the impression that the Chrisma Okeana sure. curse yeah. is in play that's because uh, I think every time I – was looking for starfish, they all run away. Um, I remember during my time on the cruise, um, if I wanted to see a starfish, we didn't see anything all day. And yesterday I was watching, not a single echinoderm, 
today I take a little time off and <laughs> from what I can see you guys have uh, uh, seen starfish galore so <laughs> anyway um, I'd have to go uh, and uh, find uh, the references to um, figure out exactly which species but I think radiaster is um, what we're seeing uh, or what we what you just saw a little while ago Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I remember that cruise. Every time you went to lunch, they saw a starfish, and then they would run down. And be like, Chris, there's yeah, a star, and I, you'd come up I and it'd be that's gone. Just, it's one of those things that happens. <laughs> well, hopefully, I have a good feeling about this dive. We'll see a lot more uh, sea stars. Oh, I hope so. Um, but it's, in any case, I'm always happy to help, and uh, obviously, everything's recorded, so. Um, it'll all it'll all still be there. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks. I'll I'll be keeping an eye open now that my eyes are open and it's. Uh, it, but but there is a lag since I'm at home and my home internet is not quite up snuff as my institutional internet. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll uh, talk spotted. to you in a bit. Jeez. Thank you. Thanks. Looking forward to hearing from you again. Always great to get the starfish hotline on the line, especially since this dive has been a fairly echinoderma palooza, unlike yesterday, in which it was a slim picking for Team Starfish. So, Megan, this is uh, looks like a good example of what we were talking about yesterday, of what you might see in unidirectional flow. So we can see on the right side of this rock, there is a fairly decent sized depression. And it looks like there's not the lee side uh, deposition that you would expect if it was strong unidirectional flow, but there still seems to be a little bit of asymmetry between the two sides. And that stands in pretty stark contrast to what we were seeing uh, yesterday with the drop stones, where it was more or less a perfectly uh, round spherical uh, impact crater uh, from those drop stones pluffing down into that really fine sediment. And those drop stones were deposited uh, quite a long time ago, right? It's hard to get a metric of how long they would have been. Um, you would presume that they were more old than they were recent just because there's a higher likelihood of drop stones happening when the glaciers were closer to this area, which obviously would be the closer we get to an ice age, the more likely they would be. But at the same time, without uh, an exact, not an exact, but even kind of a ballpark measure of marine sedimentation, hemipelagic sedimentation rates in this, eventually they do get buried even this in this really slow deposition. Um, I'm not sure what the rate would be. Again, kind of, uh, I would say, typical uh, long-term sedimentation rates in a deep sea environment is on the order of one centimeter per 1,000 years or something like that. So that would be for one of these little tiny cobbles or something like that that might be five centimeters diameter or so. It would take about 5,000 years to cover that. So that's kind of your, your just ballpark, uh, what we call a scale analysis to kind of look at the order of magnitude of a problem and get within the neighborhood of a right answer, not worrying about whether it's an actual right answer or not. Do another. Okay, that makes sense. So sedimentation rates in different parts of the ocean uh, yeah, Pat, uh, like vary good quite shape. a bit. Since we're closer to the continental for, shelf, yeah. Yeah, one more. we would expect higher sedimentation right. rates than, say, out in the middle of the ocean in the abyssal plains, right? Uh, the answer to that in classic scientific kind scientist fashion is it depends <laughs> um, and in this area this is kind of a unique area the reason that this is called hemipelagic sedimentation and not just pelagic sedimentation period is depending on where you are in the glacial interglacial cycle that 120,000 year uh, cycle that I, we, I was talking a little bit about earlier the sedimentation type that you're expected to get here is going to vary pretty dramatically 
Right now, uh, what we're seeing on screen is what you're going to get uh, when sea level is really high, which is just this really fine-grained sediment and uh, very infrequent. In this area, this has high slopes, so it might be geologically frequent on the order of every 500 or 1,000 years. You'll get a debris flow or a slope failure down slope. So if you take a core sample through this slope that we're on right now, you would kind of expect to see fine grain sediment, fine grain sediment for, you know, five centimeters or something like that. And then you might see a little package of something that looks more like these debris that we're seeing uh, sparsely interspersed on the surface. Now, if we either press fast forward or press rewind uh, about 80,000 years or something like that, so when sea levels are a lot lower, the sediment, the, the sediment regime that we see here would be probably dramatically different. This would still be below sea level. We're well within the depth that even the lowest sea level on Earth, uh, about 120 meters lower than the current level, isn't going to get any close to the depths of 1,500 meters that we're at right now. But the sediment that this region is receiving, because the glaciers are so far south and uh, there are glacial outburst floods are going into this area, is probably going to be a lot more of that uh, coarse grain mixed glacial debris rather than this real fine grain head pelagic sedimentation. This is still going to be happening during that time, but you'll see a lot more frequent intervals in a core sample during that time of coarse sediment package and that jumbled up glacial debris and till that we were talking about earlier, pushed out by floods uh, that happen on the glaciers. The geologic setting of an area is really important to understanding what kind of communities might be here. So what kind of tools do scientists use to understand sedimentation rates? Yeah, that's a really good question, Megan. Um, I, there's a whole suite of tools. Uh, age and uh, dating and chronology is one of the most important questions for geologists. It's hard to place something into a context of what was happening during the environment if you don't know what exact time it happened. Um, so the tools that scientists use uh, to determine uh, when something was deposited uh, can range from kind of the seasonal scale uh, up to millions of years. And on the seasonal scale, I think one of the tools that I'm familiar with with assessing that is a radioisotope called beryllium-7. And what that is, is it's a radioisotope that is cosmically derived, meaning that it's just uh, beaming down on the planet at all locations approximately equally. What ends up happening with beryllium-7 is it's co concentrated on the surface of water basins on land. And so that gets concentrated down into rivers that flush into the ocean. So it's one of the proxies that uh, coastal geologists use for seasonal scale sedimentation rates. Um, because it gets concentrated, and when you find sediment that has high rates of beryllium-7 close to land, that means that there's a fair amount of river source sediment. And the reason that that's a seasonal scale radioisotope is because the half-life of that radioisotope is only 53 days. So approximately five times 53, all the beryllium-7 that would have been attached to that sediment that we get in a core sample um, has turned into its child isotope, which I don't remember what it is right now. Um, on the far other end of that spectrum, you have uh, methods such as uranium-thorium dating, which I don't know as much about because I generally don't work on such long time scales. But that's a radioisotope that has a half-life, I believe, on the order of millions of years. So that's what scientists tend to use, geologists tend to use, when they're trying to date and do chronology on a lot older material than beryllium-7 might tell you an answer for. And just as a quick tie-in uh, to make the link between us, uh, one of the other tools that I think is relatively well known for, uh, for age dating within the 500 to 50,000 year range or 40,000 year range is uh, carbon, carbon-14 dating. And that is using shells or uh, organic debris, um, typically shells in the marine environment from uh, um, um, gastropods or some other ones, unsettled. and age dating uh, the shells with the radiocarbon yeah. to get an idea of how old the rock that shell was deposited in. A couple minutes for it to settle out. Look yeah. at this rock and keep moving. Sounds good. It's a nice rock. That so we nice have rock. a question from Facebook uh, from Grace Walters. Yeah. It uh, is. She wants to know how hurricanes affect sea life.
Okay. Um, well, a lot, I'll start with uh, just a, a general um, assessment in that okay. at this depth range, hurricanes probably don't affect sea life too much. So I'm a little outside of my wheelhouse here, but I do know in the basin that I'm the most familiar with, the Gulf of Mexico, I'm based down in New Orleans, start? and I did my dissertation work at Louisiana State University. Sure uh, they affect it a lot, especially on the continental shelf. When hurricanes come through, uh, the strong winds generate really large waves that can have amplitudes or maximum wave heights in excess of 15 meters or about 50 feet. Um, and those waves really just mix up the entire water column. Uh, one of the effects that that can have is it will, during the summer in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a really notable dead right. zone that starts to happen, which is caused by nice fertilizer generally and organic matter pumped out into the Gulf of Mexico. All of that fertilizer and nutrients get used by algae in the surface and other uh, primary producers. After all that food is gone and they can't subsist on it, they die off and breakdown of all that organic matter creates these giant anoxic zones on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And to get a sense of scale, they describe these uh, dead zones. Uh, the chief scientist who studies this, uh, probably the most well-known researcher, is named Nancy Rabelais at uh, Louisiana U State University. Um, they describe the size of these dead zones on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico in terms of the size of states. Sometimes it's the size of Rhode Island, sometimes the size of New Jersey in really recent summers where the dead zone has just been getting bigger and bigger. Um, so one, when a large hurricane comes through, it actually has kind of a uh, fringe beneficial effect of mixing up the water column and introducing oxygen from uh, higher areas, surface waters, down to that dead out zone, reoxygenating it and okay. kind of moving the water around some more. So that's one potential example. Uh, uh, maybe Megan can uh, take off, uh, off and give her two cents on this one. So okay, following the same uh, trend of thought uh, with the uh, bringing nutrients to the surface and that mixing, can that causes here, uh, bloom and primary productivity at the surface. So that means all those phytoplankton, all those plants at the surface are, are creating more uh, food for other animals in the water column. And that food will trickle down uh, from the surface to our deep benthos, so down to uh, the bottom of the ocean, bringing more food to the animals that we're seeing right now. So uh, potentially, a storm could be helpful to providing food to the animals that we see today. Uh, another impact that storms can have on uh, shallow water ecosystems like coral reefs is the wave action generated by storms can cause some damage. Uh, fortunately, uh, coral reefs uh, can actually help That's uh, people's pilot. habitations on land, help protect them from these large Gappy waves looks good. and that impact. And the coral reefs will eventually recover from that disturbance event. And there is a theory called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis saying that you know, consistent, uh, moderate storms can actually be helpful to increasing the diversity of the uh, ecosystem in that area. By providing a disturbance event, uh, more organisms can come in and colonize an area. We'll go up to the top. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for that, Megan, and, and thank you for that great question from Facebook. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we have several social media streams on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, that's Ocean Exploration Research. Uh, operate those feeds and we have an engagement officer on the vessel with us right now Rachel Gubra Gulbra, sorry uh, and uh, she is Go monitoring those feeds in real time so if you have any questions or anything about you, full what you see here. on our okay. dives or just in general Coming about out. our marine life and oceanography she will be happy to relay them to us and we can take our best stab at answering them And video is clear. All right. Thanks, Kayla. Okay, that's full wide. They might uh, still be doing their heading change. Uh, yeah, it looks like they're still okay. in adjustment. But uh, yeah, you saw some tethers now. I see something white off to starboard. 
Maybe a, a uh, drink or a shoe. So the dive today was proposed uh, by our partners at DFO, that's the Division of Fisheries and Oceans, Canada. And they were very interested in this location because of the potential for uh, management in this area. So right now where we're diving is just outside a proposed uh, management area. And I was wondering if Lindsay or someone on shore might want to talk a little bit more about um, management of our uh, our oceans and how marine protected areas can help our oceans. Hi, it's uh, Derek Fenton with Fisheries and Oceans. I work with the protected areas section here. So the, the backstory on this, on this site is that it was uh, through, uh, I guess, a long planning process over the last five years or so. We've identified a number of potential protected areas um, off Nova Scotia. This site was announced as what we call an area of interest, so a very general boundary is given um, back in 2018, and it was based on the available information at that time. So we've held a number of science reviews and, and compilations of information for this area. Um, it is, you know, it's well known for corals, uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, going back to 2002, first put in a, just a, a fisheries closure to the north of here. So, but the depth range in which, you know, we had any um, information was largely restricted to about 800 meters and shallower. So this is uh, one of our first opportunities to see, you know, what deep sea conservation would be beyond those depths and what we, what we would be capturing. Um, the legislation in which we do protect areas is under something called the Oceans Act. So the Gully Marine Protected Area, which we were at a few days ago, is um, one of those sites under that legislation that was designated 15 years ago. So the, the goal here is to go through a consultation process, put all the information on the table, and, and design a protected area for this, for this part of, of our region. Um, the site, uh, there's a, you can see it on our website, the full extent of what's being proposed, um, and it goes further north here and also includes a, a large basin and a bank feature. So it's, you know, trying to capture the full diversity of, of habitats and species in this part of, the, of our region is the end goal. Um, I guess with, uh, you know, where this mission fits in is that, you know, we drew a preliminary boundary and uh, the question always was, and when you get into boundary making is, you know, are, are could it be drawn in other ways? Is there other information we should have? This is quite a valuable piece for us in thinking about uh, a, f a final boundary in, in the years to come. Thanks for that, Derek. Uh, in what ways can marine protected areas uh, help uh, our, protect our resources? Okay, video, you can come in. Okay, well, it really provides a management focus. So if, you, if we use the gully as an example, you know, we've, we've restricted fishing activity in certain areas to, to avoid disturbance um, or other activities for that matter, like oil and gas exploration or other human activities. So I mean, one of the main purposes is to, is to zoom, uh, uh, avoid okay. impacts on uh, sensitive on communities, deep sea communities or shallow continues. water communities. Okay. So first and foremost, it's, it's, they're designed to, to cool, achieve so. that. Um, we'll but as that. part of it, what we've learned over the last 15 years is that once you put in a protected area, you start, you start to get a lot of other benefits that attract scientific interest and monitoring. Um, they've become a real focus for education and awareness. So they become sort of hot spots for, for all our management activities. So you, you get an enhanced, enhanced attention and, and protection of, of different parts of the ocean, um, which may tell us, uh, uh, something about, uh, you know, with this concentration of effort can help us focus our attention towards, the, you know, the effects of climate change or, or just the impacts of human activities on, on the ocean. That's really interesting. Uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah, and so just for the last uh, little bit, we've been mm -hmm. doing a Zoom on a, uh, this is a um, Venus flytrap. An enemy, and uh, just really interesting looking 
uh, species. I think this is one of my favorite we've seen on this dive. Just the, the bright colors and the overall resemblance to a uh, piranha plant from Super Mario is quite interesting. What I'm really enjoying about this anemone is all the associated organisms that we're seeing on top of it. Uh, on the left-hand side, there is what appears to be a sea spider, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Walking along the skin of this anemone. Sea spiders uh, have eight legs like uh, land spiders, but they're not very closely related. We could, uh... But they oh, have a very similar no one, feeding method in which yeah, they have a proboscis that they will um, All right. use to uh, liquefy let's see. the insides We're of what they're trying to feed on. So they the often north. are seen feeding yeah. on a Still looks pretty good. Yeah. Um, could that be what we're seeing right now? Soon. Yeah. 50 30, meters out. So uh, I'm not 30 meters sure. More. Uh, yeah. I'm not seeing if it has its proboscis inserted into this anemone. Is that max zoom? Yeah, it could be That's possible massive. that it is here because it's uh, looking to use this as a source of food. Yeah, and it's clear. Yeah. It's a little hard to There's get. There's also uh, some, looks like hydroids growing on this anemone, and on top of those, I saw a caprellid amphipod, that really strange amphipod that we saw earlier in the dive. Yeah, we're looking forward to get that. Uh, sponge sample and all the associates top side so we can uh, see exactly what it is we we're looking at on that one. All right, pilot's clear. So this is an actinus scyphia um, anemone. And video is clear. All right. And that ID was provided to us by uh, Tim Shank oh. on shore. Oh, cool fish in the water column, the chimera. I can't tell. Kind of looks like it, huh? Can I zoom in on it, Covalent? Yeah, sure. That's right with you, Levi. Yeah. Take a quick look. Yeah, that's a chimera. Very nice. Okay, looks like he's swimming down to you. Pilot, so we can come out on Sirius. We're on the move, bro. Yeah. Thirty meters. Well, you might want to start pushing ahead. I yeah. think he's still above you. Yeah. So as we're continuing our ascent up the slope. Uh, we look like we're about halfway up the slope, uh, give or take, right now. And uh, just, it's been really interesting comparing this slope uh, with similar angles to a our dive a couple days ago on the Barrel Steps uh, site. It was approximately similar gradient, but we're seeing none of the uh, kind of exposed lithology or rock face that we saw on Barrel Steps at times. So this is uh, relatively steeply sloped for the marine environment, but it's a combination of some decently sized debris and rubble at the surface uh, mixed with that fine grain hemipelagic sedimentation that's characteristic of a lot of these deep sea environments. Yes, that is our goal. Uh, make it to the top. I'm hoping to see uh, a bit more biological activity up there. Uh, yes. So that's the top, and if we have more time, uh, I think we're, we're going to turn either left or right. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, we were just uh, conferring with uh, the RV navigation um, to go over our plan for this dive. We're heading for a waypoint at the top of the slope right here. And then from there, we're going to start turning either left or right and then making a transect along the top of this ridge that we've been ascending. <laughs> 